In the aftermath of Constantine's reign, which ended in 337, the Roman Empire was formally Christian, as were members of the imperial family. Eventually, the adoption of the new faith altered how many Romans came to understand their empire and its place in the world. In short, that new view was that the Roman Empire was a holy state, sharing a special connection with the Christian God, and it was destined to uphold the faith against all enemies. For the most part, emperors governed with this in mind, but one member of Constantine's family, Julian, attempted to undo the conversion and revert Rome back to the old ways. Like all members of Constantine's family, Julian was raised and educated as a Christian, and after receiving his religious education, he became an ordained member of the clergy, reading the Bible and other scriptures in public, leading mass, and publicly taking part in religious ceremonies. All of this was, to Julian, simply something he was required to do, for in private he would have none of it, and secretly rejected Christianity. After the death of Constantine in 337, in order to secure his place among the rulers of the Roman Empire, Julian's cousin, Constantius II, butchered many other members of the Constantinian family, leaving only Constantine II and Constans, his two brothers, and Julian and his brother, Constantius Gallus, alive. The rest of his childhood was spent around the region of Asia Minor and under the care of a succession of Christian bishops and educated slaves. One of those bishops, George of Cappadocia, is probably Julian's gateway into the old world of paganism because it is George who loans Julian a series of texts on Greco-Roman literature and philosophy. It is not entirely certain when Julian actually decided to abandon Christianity, but a good guess could probably be made that he abandons the faith around the age of 20. In his early 20s, Julian was allowed to travel to Athens and study at the famous academy there. And it's known that this had a profound influence on him, but arguably the key moment was Julian's meeting of Maximus of Ephesus a few years before. Initially, Julian began to study Neoplatonism under two philosophers, Adesius and Adesius' student, Eusebius of Mindus. While Eusebius and Maximus were both Neoplatonists, Eusebius disliked him because Maximus emphasized a more mystical interpretation of the philosophy, believing in the arcane. Eusebius was strongly against beliefs such as these and warned Julian against them, but his curiosity piqued, Julian made the decision to learn under Maximus. Supposedly, Maximus had the ability to make torches burst into flame on a whim, and once even caused the statue of the goddess Hecate to grin. For Julian, this was the quote-unquote proof he needed to actually reject Christianity and see the correctness of the old ways. This personal conversion by itself probably would have meant nothing in the long run, just some form of youthful rebellion, but as circumstances would have it, Julian becomes forced into a position of leadership. By 350, out of the three sons of Constantine, only Constantius II was left alive, and thus he was the sole ruler. But as the earlier history of the 3rd and 4th centuries had shown, it was also impossible for one man to actually govern the Roman Empire. To do it well, he needed help, so Constantius II reached out to his remaining family, appointing Constantius Gallus as Caesar of the eastern half of the empire. Gallus was executed, apparently for behaving crudely towards his subjects, and Constantius then calls Julian to Milan in order to keep an eye on him, but after a while, Julian's allowed to leave and travel to Athens to study. Constantius, in any case, could hardly be bothered to really think about his cousin's academics, since he was in the middle of dealing with a rebellion by a would-be usurper, Magnentius. That was dealt with efficiently, but once peace was restored, Constantius again was confronted with that perennial problem. It was impossible to really govern the Roman Empire by yourself. It had simply become too large. His answer to this, or at least his answer to dealing with the western chunk of the empire, was to appoint Julian as Caesar in Gaul on November 6, 355. Julian was never intended to be a fully active partner in this relationship. Yes, technically he married Constantius' daughter, and was thus now a more integrated member of Constantius' family, but Constantius appears to have wanted Julian to really just function as a figurehead in Gaul and to keep the region stable. It's in Gaul that Julian has his first real encounters with both warfare and with civil administration. 
Between about 356 and 360, Julian led several military campaigns against Germanic tribes on both sides of the Rhine, and he basically wins all of them. The first campaign was conducted in 356, and he takes back multiple areas that had been taken over by the Franks. A takeover that was probably in no small way influenced by a weak Roman presence in the area. Although the campaign was successful, it was nearly undone by a tactical mistake on Julian's part. Wintering in the town of Senon, Julian had broken up his forces to garrison them in other towns and cities for the cold months, to await mustering once the spring warmed up the land and allowed war to be properly conducted again. The Franks, however, attacked his small garrison at Senon, and Julian essentially spent the winter under siege until being relieved by other units of his army. That spring and summer saw Julian and Constantius launching a joint action to retake more Roman territory and to reassert Roman control on the Rhine. The armies fail to coordinate, though, because Julian becomes held up by an attack at Lyon. So, while Julian is back in Gaul, beating off this threat, the planned attack, which called for Constantius' general Barbatio to attack the enemy with about 20 to 25,000 troops, falls through. The general is actually able to do what he set out to do, but without Julian's forces backing him up, he found himself across the Rhine, in enemy territory, and without adequate supplies, so after fighting he pulls his army back. With the Roman forces smashed, the Alemanni, led by their kings, the most notable of whom is Nodomarius, although how much power he actually had is uncertain, attacked Julian's forces near Strasbourg. The Roman army, outnumbered, manages to seize victory, and following this, Gnodomarius is sent to Milan as a prisoner, and Julian campaigns north along the Rhine, re-establishing Rome as the dominant power in the area, and striking deep into Germanic territory. With the campaigns won, the western half of the Roman Empire appeared to be in good shape, and it remained fairly stable throughout the rest of the 4th century. The situation on the eastern frontiers, though, was a different story. Shapur II, emperor of the Sasanian Empire, invaded Roman holdings in the Near East, and after a siege lasting 73 days, his forces successfully took the city of Amida. Constantius, realizing he needed troops to stop the Persians, sent orders to Gaul for soldiers to be transferred to the eastern frontiers. This order doesn't work. The actual text bypasses Julian's authority, and it's been suggested that although this looks like a slight it may not have been because to Constantius, Julian was just a subordinate, and it is directly addressed to the army commanders. What happens next isn't really clear. The troops in and around the region of Paris had no desire to leave Gaul, so they rebel, and whether Julian had anything to do with that revolt is uncertain, but rebel they do. Julian is proclaimed Augustus by the troops in Paris, and then eventually in most of Gaul, but if this was really a rebellion, Julian wasn't very much acting like a rebel. For most of the remainder of 360, he stayed in Gaul and attempted to govern as usual. It's only towards the end of 360, in about November, that Julian begins to act more like an Augustus, actually employing the term, for example, and begins minting coins. Several months after he begins doing this, his troops march down into Italy and into the Balkans, taking territory and attempting to gain peacefully to Julian's side what cities and leaders they can. Technically, the Roman Empire was now in civil war, and Constantius sends over 20,000 soldiers to meet Julian's forces, but an actual war is more or less avoided due to Constantius dying on November 3rd of 361. Supposedly, he actually names Julian as his heir, but it's not certain if that actually occurred or if it was just propaganda on Julian's part. In any case, the new emperor entered Constantinople in December, and he does two things for which he's famous or infamous, depending on your perspective. The first is that he attempts to reform the empire, for which he is perhaps best known, and the second is that he still has Persia to deal with, so Julian begins prepping for a campaign. Since the reign of Diocletian, the Roman Empire had usually, not always, but usually, been governed by at least two emperors, who were cloaked rather heavily in the mystique and pomp of royal mystery and grandeur. Constantine removes some of these elements, governing for himself, by example, and Julian largely places the blame for the current state of the empire at Constantine's feet. 
He aimed to correct what he saw as errors, but not by going back to a Diocletian system. Julian's idolization of the pagan past led him to idolize the reign of Hadrian, upon whose administration he modeled his own. Constantine's increase of the bureaucracy had actually led to governmental improvements in terms of actual administration, but Julian, viewing this as a bloated system, drastically cut the size of the central government. Instead, he advocated increased authority of the cities, although he still did take a central role in many other respects. Additionally, he drew many of his key administrators from the intellectual portion of the aristocracy. Probably his most well-known reform, or attempted reform, as emperor was the establishment of a pagan church. Julian reversed the laws passed by Constantine and his sons banning sacrifice and granting Christian clergy special privileges in the Roman Empire, and ordered the temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt, aiming to gather the support of the Jews and to foster disunity among Christians. Julian's pagan church was modeled on the Christian one, with each city having a temple and a body of priests designed to oversee it and to care for the poor. Enthusiasm for this largely appears to have been Julian's alone, though, and his attempts to return the Roman Empire to the old ways weren't entirely looked upon with favor. Ultimately, all of these attempts failed. From a macro-historical perspective, Julian's lasting legacy was the campaign launched against Persia. In more ways than one, Persia represented the main threat to the Roman Empire. While the barbarian tribes were indeed a problem, and while they sometimes coalesced into powerful states or quasi-states, such as the Dacian or Gothic confederacies, the Persian Empire was an entirely different beast. Built upon Achaemenid legacies and drawing on a wealthy urbanized core and productive farmlands in Mesopotamia, Persia was a rival to Rome in ways the Goths or Dacians simply could never be. The two states were so powerful that rhetoric of the time often referred to the two as the sun and moon of the world, and oftentimes, both rulers symbolically adopted one another. However, Constantine had planned a war against Persia. He died before the campaign could get underway, but the planning infuriated the Persians, and Constantius II had to suffer a series of military raids and attacks in consequence. So, just to reiterate from earlier in the video, because it's that important, the Shah, Shapur II, understood very clearly that the Romano-Persian frontier was highly fortified and that any attempt to do anything more than just a simple raid would entail complex logistics and long siege trains to take the fortified cities on the Roman side. So, in 359, Shapur went around the Roman fortress cities, and after weeks, the town of Amida fell to the Persians, the first major settlement to really do so. The next year, in 360, Constantius moved with an army to attack Shapur, but after learning of Julian being proclaimed emperor in Gaul, he promptly turned around to tackle this new internal threat. He died before being able to do so. Probably Julian had planned a Persian campaign in advance, but either way, a campaign begins to be prepared almost immediately in order to restore Roman prestige and to cut the Persian threat down to size. By 363, all the supplies were stockpiled and the troops required were in place. How large this army was is not certain. Ammianus Marcellinus, a major source for the late Roman Empire, tells us that there were at least 20,000 bargemen responsible for ferrying supplies on the rivers, and there probably isn't a reason to fully discount this number since he campaigned in this army, although we should still be cautious. Some estimates go up to about 70,000 troops in total, although the consensus is still out. Sending a diversionary army under his relative Procopius to entice the Persians, Julian led his troops down the Euphrates River, facing little initial resistance, but quickly finding that the route required laying siege to Mesopotamia's walled towns and cities. Julian did this, and quickly, too, occasionally leading the troops himself and taking some casualties along the way. After about a month, Julian's forces had advanced deep into Persian territory, coming to the capital of Tessaphon. Whether or not this was actually part of the original plan isn't known. The city was massive, with fortifications of equal size, and would have required at the very least months of siege, unless a traitor could open the gates. Of course, it's also possible that Julian hoped to demonstrate that the Shah was unable to protect his own kingdom, and thus should be removed, but in any case, Julian eventually came to realize that there was no hope in laying siege to the city successfully, so he made the decision to retreat. 
This time it was a retreat following the course of the Tigris River. The Persians had by this point drawn near and they began harassing the retreating Romans. And on the 26th of June, 363, the Persians attacked again and Julian rushed to the vanguard without any armor. He was stabbed with a spear during the course of events. The most likely identity of the killer is a soldier in the Persian army, but given Julian's love of the classics and paganism, another story that crops up in the surviving sources is, is that the man who took down the emperor was a Christian from the Roman side. In any case, Julian now lay dead, and a new emperor had to be chosen. A junior officer, Jovian, was chosen, and now Shapur had a choice to make. He could attack the Romans and destroy their army, or he could use diplomacy to attempt some kind of a peace deal. Battle would be costly to the Persian side as well, and would take time away that Shapur now needed to secure his position back at home. So he opted for diplomacy. Ultimately, Jovian agreed to hand over some of the border territory, and not to intervene in the politics with some of the border kingdoms, like Armenia. Julian the Apostate, for all his attempts to turn back the clock and reinvigorate the spirit of paganism in Roman hearts once more, was ultimately a failure in this respect. By this point, Christianity had become too firmly entrenched in Roman life to be easily removed, and his desire to create an organized pagan church shows clear Christian influence. Despite his efforts, Julian's beliefs ultimately remain little more than powerful personal convictions. After his death, all of his bans and other restrictions on Christianity were promptly overturned. His true legacy came in the failed war against Persia. The ceding of territory to the Persians didn't necessarily weaken the Roman state as an entire unit, but it did weaken the shared frontier between two powers. While not the straw that broke the camel's back, it was just one more issue the Romans were going to have to deal with, and they had the pagan emperor to thank.